Bismillah, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to Immunology Lesson and today we're going to talk about antigen and antigen recognition molecules. The learning outcomes for this topic are uh, firstly, for you to be able to describe, I suppose in reasonable details, what antigens are. And secondly, to relate that with the interactions with different types of antigen recognition molecules. So when I was younger, I always thought that Edward Jenner was the first person who discovered vaccination. But then I started studying philosophy of science, which needs me to read um, history of science a bit to um, contextualize evidence. Um, at some point, I realized that while we should be grateful to Edward Jenner, when we talk about him and the discovery of vaccination, we should mention Lady Mary Montagu. Lady Mary was the wife of a British ambassador who was at one time assigned to the Ottoman Empire. Um, when she was in Istanbul, Lady Mary befriended Muslim doctors there. She saw immunization practice called variolation, which is um, vaccination against smallpox. So, uh, and then she started writing about it to the people in England, saying something like, um, guys, the doctors here is doing this cool immunization thing. She even tested the vaccination method on her own daughter. And uh, later on, those letters were studied by um, Edward Jenner, and only then he started practicing it uh, in Britain. So that, for me, is an example of, um, you know, um, as science students, you are usually offered Western-centric stories of how science and technology develop. It reinforces the view that the secular Western way of thinking is the best way to think about science. Uh, to be good in science, we have to be like them. But maybe that's true. Maybe that is the case, you know. But I just want to encourage you, as you mature as a learner, try to expand your reading to non-Western scholarships as well, to see diverse worldviews when it comes to the philosophy and uh, history of science. Now, what allows vaccination to be amazingly successful is the role of antigens and their recognitions. So antigens are any substances that bind to antibodies, B cell receptors, and T cell receptors. And you want to differentiate antigens from immunogens. So immunogens are substances that activate the immune response. So not all antigens are immunogens. For example, there's a compound called dinitrophenol. So dinitrophenol is an antigen because it can bind to antibodies. But on its own, it can't trigger an immune response because it's, it's too small. So tiny antigens like dinitrophenol are also called haptins. What we can do then is we attach haptins to carriers. So carriers can be larger molecules like um, polysaccharides. Why do we want to do that? We do it so that the hapten carrier complex can be big enough to stimulate immune response. So they can become immunogen. The location where the antigen binds to antibodies is called epitopes. So on the surface of antigens, you have certain sites where antibodies can bind to them. Um, those sites are what we call antigenic determinants or epitopes. And when you have bacterium, for example, it can actually have multiple forms of antigens. Your antigens can be, for instance, uh, at one place, the cell wall polysaccharides, or at other place, uh, uh, proteins of the flagellum. So this is crucial because it provides alternatives for our body, our immune system to detect infections. Even with a single antigen, you can have multiple epitopes on it. And this phenomenon is called polyvalency or multivalency. It is when you have more than one epitope on a single antigen. You can find it on microbial surface. And if your antigen is a DNA or RNA, you can observe those identical epitopes being regularly repeated along the chain of that nucleic acid molecule. All right, 
Another point to remember is that antigen recognition is not uh, black and white. When the receptors see an antigen, they're not going to go either this one is absolutely an infection or that one is absolutely not a pathogen. So it doesn't work that way. Um, sometimes they are very sure in their antigen recognition. Sometimes they are not so sure. So those levels of strengths of recognition is what we call antigenicity. Antigenicity is influenced by three factors. One is size. The larger the antigen, the easier for the antibodies or lymphocyte receptors to bind to the antigen. So it means it has higher antigenicity. Secondly is complexity. So for example, if a molecule is just a peptide strand of the same simple monomers repeated again and again, then it has low antigenicity. If, on the other hand, it is a, a, a varied mix of protein monomers that look different from each other, then that molecule is more likely to be uh, recognized by antibodies. The third factor is what is called foreignness. The more alien, the more foreign the target looks like uh, compared to native molecules in our body, the higher is its antigenicity and the easier it is to be recognized by our immunity. And that recognition is done by antigen recognition molecules such as antibodies. So antibodies are generated by B cells or specifically plasma cells, which we'll talk about uh, in the future episodes. So antibodies can come in two forms. One is you find them attached to uh, B cell membranes. So in this form, they are often called B cell receptors in the literature. The second form is free floating. So the B cells secretes them and they travel away from the cells from their cellular origins. So these are often what we have in mind when we say antibodies. And in the literature, you're gonna find a lot of Ig being mentioned. Um, IgM, IgG, and when you see Ig, it's not that uh, social media platform owned by Meta. Um, instead, in immunology, Ig means immunoglobulin, which is another word for an antibody. So why are they calling the same thing with two different names? Uh, th there is a historical reason that um, you can look up in your own time. But for our purpose, when you see Ig, think of antibody, yeah? All antibodies have basic similar structural characteristics. And that's how we class them together. What's different among them is the region where they bind to antigen. So antibodies look like the letter Y, and at the upper tip of it, you have the antigen binding site. The antigen binding site is where the epitope will bind to and where you can find most structural varieties among the antibodies. You have two chains for antibodies. One is heavy and one is light. And for both, you have V regions and C region. So you have heavy chains and you have light chains. So for each chain, you have the amino terminal or the amino end of the antibody protein. And this terminal is called V for variable region. And on the opposite side, the carboxyl end, you have the terminal region called C for constant. Another way you can structurally describe an antibody is the FAB region versus FC region. The FAB is the part above the hinge, which has the V of the heavy chain plus the V of the light chain. So the antibody has the hinge, the um, movable joint in the middle. So it can literally move. It can bend apart when the antibody is binding to two separate epitopes. Um, we call the part above the hinge FAB region, which stands for um, fragment antibody. No, no, um, fragment antigen binding. Yeah, that's it. Because on each side of the FAB, we have 
two V regions for antigen binding. One is the V region for heavy chain, VH, and the other one is the V region for the light chain, VL. So these FAB regions are important for the antigen recognition and um, binding activities. And we can juxtapose that against the FC region, which is the stem of the antibody, which consists of the C region of the heavy chain. So the FC region, as opposed to the FAB, the FC region does not participate in antigen recognition. Instead, it is involved in the effective functions, which we'll talk about later when we look deeper into the adaptive immune response. The surface of antigen binding site is planar, meaning roughly um, it has two dimensional flat area uh, that allows the site to accommodate conformational epitopes of uh, macromolecules. So that means the white flat area can um, adjust itself to bind to the specific conformations, the specific shapes of your particular epitopes. And that is affected by CDRs or complementarity determining regions. So you've got three CDRs, um, CDR1, CDR2, CDR3. So these CDRs together is also called um, hypervariable region. Uh, it means they are extremely varied between antibodies. So it needs to be hypervaried like that because that variety um, diversifies the way CDRs can bind to diverse shapes of antigens. Um, it means um, if you have antigen coming into your body, there's a good chance that there are antibodies in your body that can bind precisely to that shape. So you have your V regions on your FAB part of the antibody, and then at the edge of it, um, at the edge of that V region, you have the CDRs, which conform to the shape of the target antigen so that the, the binding can happen. This binding between antigen and antibody is non-covalent in nature. Uh, depending on the exact interaction of that binding, you can have electrostatic forces, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals forces, um, hydrophobic interactions. Um, so the key feature of these non-covalent bindings is that uh, it is reversible. The binding is not permanent. And the strength of that reversible binding is called affinity. Affinity is measured by dissociation constant. Um, it tells you the um, relative easiness of breaking that antigen antibody binding. The higher the dissociation constant, the easier to break that antigen antibody binding. That also means the higher the KD value, the lower the particular affinity is. And the typical value in an antibody mediated immune response is between 10 to the power of negative 7 to 10 to the power of negative 11 molar. One crucial point to remember is that for polyvalent antigens, just because the affinity is low, it doesn't necessarily mean the overall binding strength is low. Why is that? Because remember, in polyvalency, you've got many epitopes. So when you have an antigen with many epitopes, it can bind to antibody at multiple places at once. So large antibodies like IgM, they can bind up to 10 epitopes uh, in one go. So even if each epitope binds with low affinity, all 10 of them together can create a strong overall binding strength. And that overall binding strength is what we call avidity. All right, we're going to stop here. Your homework will be to perhaps draw a mind map to study classes of immunoglobulins. So there are five of them, Ig. IgG, M, A, E, and D. So identify what's similar, what's different, in which disease context each of them are more salient, you know, more active. Get, get to a point where if in the exam you see features of an immunoglobulin, you can tell which class of Ig that belongs to. Um, 
that will help you understand future materials much more easily, inshallah. Right? So talk to you next time. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.